is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology in the UCLA School of Medicine and holds the Stephen Hattos Chair for Neuropharmacology. He received his PhD, his BSc from Polytechnic of, of um, Central London in 1976, his PhD from the Medical Research Council Institute in the Imperial College in London. Dr. Hattos is the uh, currently the director of the Hattos Center for Neuropharmacology in the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA. His research has been supported by the Center for Opioid Receptors and Drugs of Abuse, an NIH-funded center that directs that he directs that has been continuously funded by the NIH P50 Center of Excellent Grants for 33 years. It's quite impressive. Dr. Evans' research accomplishments includes the identification and characteristics of several novel endogenous opiates or endorphins and kephalins, the cloning of the first opiate receptor at UCLA. Formative studies demonstrate opiate agonist bias, the ability of opiate agonist drugs to stimulate opiate receptors in different modalities. His research focuses on brain circuits that sustain opiate reward uh, behaviors, both in terms of brain adaptive adaptions to chronic opiate drugs and learn relief of negative effect using a combination of mouse genetics, cell biology and pharmacokinetic pharmacology. Dr. Evans has published over 220 peer reviewed publications um, and has had over 11,000 citations of his research papers. Dr. Evans earned the Lifetime Achievement Award from the University of Westminster. Dr. Evans has been a very important part of our SART program. He was also one of my first mentors when I moved to Los Angeles in, 19, in, in 1995 and helped me get my first grant. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans, for participating in today's uh, institute. His talk today is Molecular Mechanisms of Drug, Abuse, uh, drug Addiction. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so I, I saw my role here as sort of uh, introducing sort of generally uh, how I think about um, substance abuse and all the players and um, and how they interact. So I've got a very, very um, sort of somewhat superficial, but I think it'll hopefully give you a, an idea how I think about uh, substance abuse in, in the big picture. So it's a sort of a big picture overview of, of, of how I think of things. And then later on, I think I've got another talk at between 12 and one on, on some specific um, issues or I'll talk about molecular tools, some of the genetic tools that we use, like the knockouts, the conditional knockouts, um, how, how we can use the uh, free mice and the flox mice to uh, really look at mechanisms and cells involved in and receptors involved in different functions um, in different systems. So I'll talk about that in the afternoon, but, but, uh, but now I'm just going to talk more about a uh, sort of general overview. And um, I'm going to start with, a, with the, some, some, some sort of <laughs> slides, which I often use. And as this guy, Brian Lewis uh, Sanders, he, he, uh, he um, drew people, um, well, he drew himself actually. He did self portraits under many, many different drugs. So he, he, um, he painted himself and he got some great, great uh, pictures, which I really like. Um, this is uh, cocaine and Ritalin. Um, these of course have exactly the same mechanism of action um, in blocking the reuptake of, um, of dopamine and, um, but uh, obviously he had very, very different effects probably because he took them very, very different ways. Uh, Ritalin's, you know, oral, oral medication takes a long time to work. And cocaine, probably he uh, snorted his cocaine or in, maybe even injected it, but uh, very different effects uh, from the same drug. So, um, you know, this Adderall and bath salts both have the same mechanisms. Um, reverse efflux of uh, dopamine and causing um, an increase in synaptic dopamine via uh, the um, reverse efflux through the transporter. So these are the, these have more or less the same mechanisms. The the, the cathodones, uh, which are derivatives of 
uh, cathinone, which is found in cat, which is actually a very um, widely used drug um, in, in some places in the world. And Adderall, of course, you all know of um, um, amphetamine causing the, uh, uh, and used still clinically in many, in many areas, including ADHD. And some people studying for exams, which obviously doesn't really work very well, but <laughs> some people think it does. Okay, uh, crystal meth. Um, we, I, I think Edie probably will talk a little bit about meth and some of the psychostimulants later on, um, and imaging and imaging results from there. But um, you know, I mean, this is a pretty destructive drug, mostly because of the way it's taken and all the contaminants in making crystal meth, the acids and the bases so, um, and, and the solvents. So the, it's really not the drug itself here, it's, it, it, that's, that can be really destructive. Well, it, it's, it's me, me, many of the contaminants which go along with it, causing the tooth decay and, and many of the, um, the issues with, with crystal meth. So it's not just the drug, it's often, things which are associated, associated with it. Um, I don't know if, if you've heard of, of crocodile, but this is a, um, um, a, a derivative of morphine, which is incredibly potent and made in Russia because they can only get, in, in Russia, it's very difficult to uh, get uh, um, uh, opiate type drugs, and, but they can get um, cough medicine, which has codeine in, and they create this uh, drug um, which is a derivative of morphine, um, and which is incredibly potent. And but it's the contaminants within that that they inject themselves, and they get these big, uh, big uh, lesions on their skin from injecting the um, contaminants of the synthesis uh, into their bodies, and often have to lose their legs, have amputations, and things from from uh, getting addicted to these drugs. So it's not often, it's not always just a drug, it's uh, some of the contaminants which, uh, which, uh, which are made with it. Uh, marijuana, this is him self on marijuana. And of course, um, this is becoming legal. It's becoming infiltrated almost in as a sort of co-drug like alcohol and nicotine has been for many years. Um, many people are um, taking CHC and CBD. CBD, you still don't really know how it works. Um, nothing like THC, which clearly interacts with the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. But um, CBD uh, has some uh, psychoactive effects. I mean, it's very effective in stopping the seizures, uh, pediatric seizures, but um, it's really unclear how that drug is doing that. And so there's still some, some work in the uh, cannabis area to try and figure out um, how how these drugs, how 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 some of the cannabinoids are working, and of course there's like eighty or eighty plus cannabinoids in in the cannabis plant, and all of these are mixing and and doing things together. So it's a it's a really complex area, which uh, which needs um, sorting out. Um, mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, we. We, we don't really consider these a, a real threat for addiction, but um, clearly they, they take people into uh, different um, realms of being. And um, I think kind of they're becoming more accepted now as treatments for depression. And um, there's lots of clinical trials now going on for using um, uh, these uh, hallucinogens for helping with different states. In, in fact, even addiction, um, there's some studies going on with uh, many of the hallucinogens with addictive states, depressive states, and um, uh, anhedonia in, um, in, in um, aged, aged patients. So there's some interesting work going on there. Salvia um, is still legal in many places. Uh, it's, it's uh, legal here um, after um, 18 or 21, maybe it's, maybe it's 21. Still a legal drug, very potent hallucinogen. Um, it's an interesting drug to me because it works on one of the opiate receptors, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, it works on the kappa opiate receptor, which has totally opposite effects of the mu opiate receptor and all of the endogenous opioids that you know about. 
Uh, it's very um, dysphoric in, to, to many people. Many people take salvia and they'll never take it ever again. Um, very few people actually really like this drug. So that's probably why the, the um, DEA and the FDA have sort of left it alone. Um, it's been sort of um, immune to, um, and, and in many places it's still legal. As I say, they, they, they can, you can buy this in, in head shops in North Carolina, for instance, no problem. Um, lots of different uh, doses and um, um, it's, it's completely legal. Um, opioids is my area and um, I've done a lot of work on these. This is my, uh, so since my PhD, been working on opioids. Um, uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone, been very um, influential in, as we had in the last um, meeting here, we had talked about the opioid crisis. Oxycodone was a major driver and hydrocodone and major drivers in, in pushing the opioid crisis to where it, where it ended. And I'll um, be talking about that, the, some of the actions of those, these drugs a little bit later. Okay, and then of course, there's the, uh, the benzos and, and um, not to be forgotten at all, benzos and alcohol, which are major players in, in, in addictive states and often co-used with opioids to, for, for the overdose uh, deaths because they're synergistic with um, um, opiate drugs and cause the respiratory depression to occur at much lower doses. So if you, if you add um, benzos or alcohol with, um, with uh, some uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone, that's a sort of a sure recipe for respiratory depression. And um, many of the overdose deaths, uh, multi-drugs, um, drug use, with um, opioids and benzodiazepines or barbiturates or, or uh, alcohol. Dr. Evans? Yeah. What is SOMA? SOMA is, um, is um, it's one of the drugs which interact with the GABA ray receptor. Um, it's, I think it's a, um, a type of benzo. Yeah, it's used uh, for going sleep and a muscle relaxant. Yeah, I, 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 it's... Um, I, I think it, it, it's, it hits one of the sites on the GABA ray receptor. I'm not sure which one. Um, there are so many sites. I'll show, got a picture a little later showing all the different sites on the GABA ray receptor where alcohol binds, barbiturates bind, quaaludes bind. They're all different sites on the GABA ray receptor. And um, um, so, sometimes then it's not clear which site they're using, just that it's uh, interacting with the GABA ray receptor. Thank you. Yeah. And then of course, alcohol and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a very dirty drug. Well, most of these drugs are pretty dirty. They see many different targets. Um, alcohol and nitrous oxide mainly go for GABA ray receptors and NMDA receptors. Uh, nitrous oxide being a blocker of the NMDA receptors and alcohol being an allosteric modulator, a positive allosteric modulator. So increasing the actions of GABA. So having, having a combination of an NMDA antagonists like ketamine, you know, working like ketamine, that's how nitrous oxide works, and um, a uh, GABA ray enhancer, you've got these two major systems, the, the inhibitory system, the GABA system being enhanced, and the excitatory system, either for an NMDA or AMPA receptors, being um, inhibited, you've got a very potent way of sort of calming down the brain. So uh, nitrous oxide now called dirty drugs, they work on many, many different targets, acetylcholine receptors, opiate receptors, cannabinoid receptors, you know, at different concentrations, but they're, they're very dirty drugs. Anyway, um, and then of course there's the inhalants, which are even the dirtiest drugs we know of, and still a, a, a problem. Actually, has been a kind of an increasing problem. The use of inhalants um, in very recent years, They've, it's it's gone up, which is a bit troubling because these are incredibly um, uh, sort of destructive drugs to the brain, dissolving fats and and uh, really really destructive drugs. So. 
Um, obviously, many different types of drugs are misused. They have many, many different targets, and we'll talk about targets in a second. And often a fine line between therapeutics and um, abuse drugs. And, and um, there's a, one thing that he's really missing here is big picture is that uh, obviously there's two actions of drugs. There's the intoxicated state and the abstinence state. And I think many people forget about this abstinence state, but it's really the most important for driving uh, addict, uh, addiction. And really the important thing is not just understanding how drugs work on in the intoxicating phase, but really understanding how drugs modulate the brain for um, um, changing the brain for future drug actions and during withdrawal states. And that's kind of what we're really interested in. What do the drugs do to the brain that makes the brain um, change with its with it, with a response to its behaviors. So it's the it's the long lasting effects that we're really interesting in. That really like memories, like um, um, allosteric changes, which uh, allostatic changes, which which regulate the um, which, which regulate the brain and which are opponent processes. Um, that uh, are induced by the, the drug state. So, you know, I mean, obviously many of these uh, opiates, they, it, we talk about opioids, they, they, um, they are very good analgesics, they make you feel good, they make you feel sleepy, but the withdrawal is always a, a, the opposite of that state. So the brain adapts to those states. And what are those adapt adaptive processes is what interests me. What changes in the brain to um, result in the withdrawal, or, or the re result in the changes which you get with the abstinence state. And um, I think that's very interesting. Sort of common to almost every drug is this, uh, um, which is uh, addictive, is this anhedonic state during the withdrawal and, and this uh, obviously the craving. And these we believe are really due to um, the changes in the dopaminergic system where um, the dopamine system is, is stimulated by all the drugs we know. But then when you take away that stimulation, you're left with a, um, a, a dopamine system, which is really not working very well at all. It's desensitized in many as aspects. Um, it doesn't work very well. So we think that that's clearly the, um, the, uh, the the um, driver of a lot of the uh, anhedonia you see when when um, um, there's the, in the withdrawal stays and the abstinence stays and they, these can last for a long time. So um, basically, saying we shouldn't just focus on the um, intoxicated state, but we need to look at the abstinence states, and these are probably the most important for the continued um, taking of drugs. Okay, so um, obviously there's many, many different targets. We've talked a little bit about some of the targets, and these are gonna um, these are gonna uh, modify the targets they hit. They're gonna have many downstream targets: the cell signaling, cell excitability, gene expression. All of these things change with um, with acute actions of drugs. This leads to circuit modulation. And then these adaptations, which occur directly after intoxicated in after intoxication, and this is including the connectome, how how the how the neurons connect, how many spines they make, many many studies showing many different uh, changes in spine densities in the striatum after uh, opioids or or psychostimulants. Sometimes they have opposite effects. Some of them are the same after many many years. So the connectome changes, the gene expression changes, and some of these um, changes modify behavior, and this can be the days or, or for decades. So, um, you know, if we if we go through the different stages of addiction, uh, we can envisage that, um, you know, there's A, that there's susceptibilities at each stage, and B, that the, the, these ch the, the changes in the brain are going to be very different depending on what uh, stage you're looking at. 
So after abstinence for many years, um, the triggers um, are there because of memories. They, they, they mem you have a memory of how the drug works and that's going to stay forever. And um, uh, craving can occur if those memories are triggered. So um, this is kind of how I see it. And, um, you know, uh, in the withdrawal phase, the only way of getting out of withdrawal is to take the drug again. So these are, these are uh, sort of the concepts that uh, we're interested in. Okay, so let's have a look at the drug, drug targets, many, many different drug targets. Um, if we look at the G-protein coupled receptors, these are the ones I'm interested in, the opioids, the uh, THC hallucinogens, um, ligand-gated channels, the nicotine, benzos, alcohol, and inhalants, many of the inhalants. And obviously there's the um, transporters, which we talked about with this, uh, the stimulants. They're the, they're the uh, targets for the um, uh, many of the stimulants with the um, uh, cocaine, amphetamine, um, nicotine, of course, is a lichen-gated channel. But um, all of these drugs have different targets and, um, and uh, they um, all seem to trigger these, can trigger these addictive uh, processes. Okay, so um, I have a little poll here and, uh, and these are, this is a couple of G protein coupled receptors. Uh, why might THC, salvia, and oxycodone? Let's see if I can start the poll. And I've got to use the second poll, which is here. Um, okay, so let, let's make sure to see if everyone's <laughs> following me here. Okay, so um, you should be able to answer the poll here. So why might THC, uh, oxycodone that interact with G protons have very different actions? The drugs access different parts of the brain. The drug targets have different cellular uh, targets, uh, signal transduction uh, pathways. Uh, the drugs all have off-target sites. The drug targets are on different cells. Um, none of the above makes sense. Is no one going to answer the? <laughs> uh Dr. Evans, for some reason on my computer, it showed up as the poll results. Um, maybe can you try sharing the poll again? Let me try relaunching Is everyone it. Else, what's everyone else saying? Let me try relaunching okay. it. Does that work? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Good. Great. Perfect. Great. Okay. We'll leave five, five more seconds. Okay. So I think we got like four, five, six, seven, eight people answering. Okay. So we've got eight answers anyway. So let me end the poll and share the results. Okay. So uh, most of you think B, that targets have different signal transduction pathways. Um, well, um, if, we if we take a look at these three, oops, let's go back. If we take a look at these three, uh, receptors actually their um, um, signal transduction pathways are more or less identical. Um, so let's so B is not really the right answer. Um, the drugs have different access to different parts of the brain. They may do um, the signal signal transduction pathways are actually the same. The other drugs have all, all have off target sites. They probably do, but that's not really the reasons. The drug targets are on different cells. So this is really the, um, the right answer. And um, so it, it, it's really all about location of receptors. So this is these, these opiate receptors. The, uh, this is the mu opiate receptor, the one which has all the effects of oxycodone and hydrocodone that you know of, the rewarding effects, the analgesic effects. This is a delta receptor, and this is the kappa opiate receptor, which is the target of salvia to produce hallucinations. They're almost identical to receptors, very, very highly homologous. They signal the same ways, but they can have a very, very opposite effects. So it's really all about location of these receptors on which, on which cell types they are in the brain. And really important to understand that it's not um it's not really anything else but 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 where these which which receptors these are uh, which uh, cell types these are expressed in 
um, in, in the brain. So for instance, um, these, uh, all, all these, these receptors are inhibitory, they inhibit um, um, cell firing and um, like the caprope receptors are, is on dopaminergic cells. So it inhibits dopaminergic firing. Whereas the um, um, uh, mu opiate receptors are on GABAergic uh, um, neurons, which actually tonically inhibit uh, dopamine firing and then uh, disinhibit the release of dopamine. So they, they, they can have opposite effects, although they have the same signaling. Okay, so this just shows you the signaling cascades, which all of these receptors use. They're all GIGO coupled receptors. Uh, they inhibit denylate cyclase. Um, you know, they activate MAP kinase, but they also um, activate potassium channels and inhibit calcium influx. So they're actually inhibitory on uh, for cell activation. Okay, just a, a, a look at the um, um, uh, so some of the molecular targets. I mean, this is this GABA eight receptor is a is a whopping one for um, many of the drugs that um, we, we know and love. Um, ethanol, for instance, has a couple of sites on these GABA ray receptors as a very high affinity site. Um, it's often called um, the one drink uh, subunit uh, uh, because it has this, this delta, uh, very high affinity site, which is activated very low concentrations of ethanol. And then there's a higher site, which um, acts like um, some of the general anesthetics, um, isoflurin, um, uh, um, um, and other anesthetics, uh, quaaludes interact at this site. Barbiturates in interact at this site here, which is more of a channel blocking site, whereas benzodiazepines uh, act here, which affect the, the um, uh, um, affinity of GABA. So they have kind of different mechanisms and barbiturates, of course, are now largely uh, super, um, take, you know, um, superseded by the benzodiazepines because they don't have such um, um, uh, an efficacious um, influence over these GABA receptors. So it's less likely to overdose on benzodiaz benzodiazepines than it is barbiturates. They have kind of different mechanisms. Uh, benzodiazepines require the GABA to be there. Barbiturates at high concentrations can actually be um, uh, agonists themselves. So they have somewhat different mechanisms. And uh, um, I think it's just so interesting. This receptor is basically the target of many, many, many different drugs. Okay, so um, if we look at the, the um, um, pathways, and I think let me see how much time, how much time have I got, Ted? You have about uh, 14 minutes. 14 minutes. Okay, so if, let's sort of have a look at the, um, the circuits and the, the circuit sort of uh, analysis started actually, uh, Jim Olds was at UCLA for many years and uh, is in the 50s. He was uh, studying these uh, electrical stimulation of different parts of the uh, brain with, um, electrodes and he noticed that this rat would keep on coming back to the same place when he, he uh, um, went, when he stimulated in certain parts of the brain. So he designed this uh, system where he had these electrodes there and he had a lever which the rat could, could uh, press to get the electrical stimulation. And he found some areas of the brain which um, would, the rat would just not stop uh, pushing that lever. Uh, it was like 2000 times an hour. He would just be pressing this and wouldn't care about anything else in his life, but pressing that lever, which I find actually quite striking that there's parts of the brain you can stimulate like this. And, and the, um, the behavior is so, the, 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 the behavior response is so important to that animal that it won't do anything else, but hit that lever. And, you know, mothers will they'll abandon their pups, they'll ignore water and food, they'll go across painful um, stimuli to get to their, um, to this lever. So it's a very, very potent um, uh, behavioral modifier. It, it, it just takes, it takes over all of the behavior of the animal just by stimulating that circuit. 
And um, uh, what Jim did, Jim Olds did, uh, some of this work was done, as I say, at UCLA. He mapped the areas where there was self-stimulation. He called it pleasure. I'm not sure quite if you can call it pleasure, but he 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 map the areas where you've got self-stimulation and, and it's good to know that there's lots of different areas of the brain you can get get self-stimulation and there's a couple which uh cause aversion these are areas uh the periaqueductal gray which is involved in in pain um, um uh pain responses the amygdala involved in fear and the medial hypothalamus, uh, which is involved in stress stress responses, these were activated. Um, he, he when he, he stimulated these, he got aversion to the to um, so the the animals would not press the levers at all. But there was many many different areas he could get this self stimulation, which is um, which is quite quite impressive, and good to know. Actually, it's good to know. Okay, so then he he he. Um, he mapped the areas which had the most intense um, uh, self-stimulation. And these were areas which were involved in dopaminergic systems. And uh, he, he, he could show, at least in, in many of the areas, he got self-stimulation, that it was dopamine dependent. So he, he's, he demonstrated there was release. He could do chemical lesions of the, different, the, the, the two different sides, and he could get um, self-stimulation on one side and not the other to side, depending on if he'd lesion the dopaminergic neurons. And then there was a, a bunch of pharmacology he did to show that um, the dopamine system was very important in these uh, responses. So this was really old studies. These were in the 50s, but they were really important to our thinking. And, um, and, and now we sort of, um, with modern technology, got to sort of try to understand how every drug can cause stimulation of dopamine. And there are many, many different mechanisms. And this is a kind of a convergence for all of the drugs. Um, how they do, how they cause dopamine release is very different for different drugs. Um, some of them are uh, like um, cocaine and amphetamine are, are, are um, increased in the dopamine in the synapse <coughs> by multiple mechanisms. Some are um, disinhibiting inhibitory neurons, which are on the dopamine neurons. So that's, that's one common mechanism which, which opiates work. They are often um, um, on GABAergic um, interneurons and they inhibit the release of GABA, which is tonically inhibiting these dopamine neurons. So it's really a disinhibition process. Um, alcohol, you know, with, um, with, has many, many different sites which it can work. The NMDA receptors, the, um, um, the receptors for uh, um, GABA, uh, many, many different sites that alcohol can work in, in releasing dopamine, which it does. And even, even the inhalant drugs like toluene cause pretty substantial releases of uh, dopamine. So um, some of the inhalant abuse could be explained by dopamine release as well. Um, so, I mean, it's a complex story uh, about how and the targets for um, these different drugs can cause dopamine release, but all of the ones we know of do, and, and the mechanisms are still somewhat a little bit cloudy for some of these drugs, like, uh, as I said, alcohol and inhalants, um, and um, even nicotine has, has some, some questions left about how it's actually uh, causing release of, of, uh, um, of, of uh, dopamine. Okay, so, um, and I should, should mention that mu opa receptors are here so that they're causing a disinhibition of GABA, which is inhibiting this dopamine release, but kappa opa receptors are actually here on the, on the uh, dopamine release. So they actually directly inhibit uh, dopamine release. So they are not, um, uh, so, you know, they, they aren't really um, in your kind of addictive rewarding type drugs. And again, one of the rationales, I think, for salvia not being a restricted drug. 
hallucinogen. Okay, so um, dopamine, of course, is uh, a bit complex in itself. It's not just a, a signal for reward, um, for the actual reward. It can be anticipatory. And um, there's some very elegant studies which show that, um, you know, the um, after training, after expectation, the dopamine system does not respond to the reward itself. It may respond more to the cues. So this is, this is the condition stimulus. So this experiment, the, um, this was a primate, um, was, was trained to get a reward. And after um, a considerable amount of training, no firing occurred when it actually gets the reward. But if they delayed the reward, there was a lack of firing and then the reward uh, and then when the reward was given, there was a, um, a firing of these dopaminergic neurons. Um, if the reward was precocious, so it came before it was unexpected, again, there was firing of these dopamine neurons. So the dopamine neuron wasn't just um, firing when it got the reward, it was um, firing when the reward was, um, was not predicted. It became, it was predict when it was predicted, it stopped firing. But when it was not predicted, then um, um, the dopaminergic neurons were firing. So it's kind of a learning. It's saying uh, is really telling the brain to take note, as opposed to just responding to the rewards. Okay, so I think that's an interesting caveat of the dopamine system. It's not just a reward um, uh, monitor. It's really looking at the, um, whether, whether the reward is predicted or not, or, or anticipated, and it will fire accordingly. Okay, so if we look at the different stages of addiction, this is the binge intoxication stage we talked about before. We consider mostly it's involved in this dopaminergic system, um, the uh, ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens, that's the, area which we uh, uh, consider is the driver of most of the behaviors. <clears throat> and um, this is really what, uh, um, you know, most people, most research is, is, is geared to look at is how, how dopamine is being released, how it's regulated, and um, how, how, how the different receptors on the different pathways are mediating dopamine release. So this has been a big, the, the major, major um, thrust of the research here. But of course, um, <clears throat> when, when, when drugs are given for a long time, this is um, a, very, a very important uh, cellular process that has been account, accounting for some of the opioid changes, the opponent processes which go on with opioids, that if you, if you inhibit um, adenylate cyclase for a long time. Um, this, if you put an agonist, say this is an opioid, you inhibit adenylate cyclase, you keep it on. <clears throat> and then there's, when you take away the drug, there's this big increase when you stimulate this adenylate cyclase. So there's a big upregulation of adenylate cyclase. And this we think is a major driver of um, some of the processes which happen in, um, in, in rev when, when you take away the opiate drugs and they're a big driver in, 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 in creating the negative affective states and the opponent processes which you get with opioids. You know, the opioids themselves call, causing a relaxed state, the withdrawal being a, a very agitated state. This is one of the cellular processes which, which happens. Okay, and then of course with withdrawal, there's, there's other areas of the brain which are activated. Um, a number of these stress circuits um, um, involving the hypothalamus and the amygdala. These are areas which people are now getting into a lot and um, trying to figure out what are the circuits involved during, during withdrawal and um, and um, uh, and craving, and and these are these are much later stages where there's really more memory processes where the prefrontal cortex gets involved, where there is triggers, and um, 
our explanation uh, um, is really a sort of a learned response. So I'll, I'll sort of give you our, our our take about with a little with a little story, which uh, we published a, a while back. It's a very simple sort of concept, um, but this is sort of a story about. Uh, we called her Laura. She she um, broke her ankle while she was um, she was uh, trying out for um, the uh, cheerleading team, and she got pretty upset that she twisted her ankle, and so she went home and she remembered her brother had um, just had his teeth out and had um, a bunch of uh, oxycodone left in his. Uh, is in the in the medicine cabinet. So she um, went home. She was a bit dejected. She took the drug and she, you know, she perked herself up. Her pain went away, and so um, that was good. Next day, she took it again, and she these, this is the drug here. She took the drug the first day. The next day, uh, she took it again, and then she uh, took it again and again because she, you know, it wore off. Is a sort of uh, almost a sort of a, um, a a mini withdrawal, and as she took the drug, obviously she became tolerant to the drug. The opponent processes started kicking in, and then she ran out of the drug. But in this in this place, she'd learned that the drug took away a lot of her negative affect, uh, took away her anhedonia, her 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 anxiety, her dysphoric uh, states. Uh, that she had been feeling for being de uh, dejected from the um, from 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 the cheerleading team because she's not wasn't going to be chosen, and then of course she went through withdrawal, where she had a, 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 a period of negative affect, and was anxiety had anxiety was anhedonic, wasn't feeling good about her life. And then she had a life stressor, and this is our very often that stress-induced relapse is a is a major major issue, and she, and that was a reminder, a same kind of feelings of anhedonia, and this gave her craving, and obviously um, you know oxycodone was pretty expensive, heroin's much cheaper drug, um, and this is a problem these days because it is a very cheap 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 drug, and often contaminated now with fentanyl, so. This was she. She took um, the fentanyl because that's what she could get her hands on, and had the same relief. But obviously, fentanyl has a uh, um, uh, heroin and fentanyl have much shorter half life, so she was having to take this much more and much more, and again had a very fast uh, tolerance, and um, overdosed. So this was the story of of Laura, and I I I think that. That may not be atypical, that the drugs not only take away pain, but they also take away emotional pain. And this becomes a learning process. So our thesis here was that um, really that repeated use of really consolidates the memory that uh, opioids actually leave stress and dysphoric states. And that, you know, you can take this drug again and again, but when you have abstinence, um, you've really established a memory of what that drug does and, uh, and generalized to a life stress event where this actually causes craving because you remember that this drug was very effective at taking away your depression or your anxiety or your stress and um, causes uh, craving and then drug relapse. And so you get into the cycle again. And you know, this is on the right hand, we got some of the molecular um, aspects that we consider are important here. One of them is this um, opponent process, which I mentioned a little bit, this um, uh, adenylate cyclase, which happens in the cell with mu opioid receptors. So when you, um, when you activate them, you have an inhibitory process, but when you go through withdrawal, this, is, this cell is activated. But lots of other things happen. And we've done some work here on the activation of uh, microglia, um, which uh, seem to be controlling the uh, dopaminergic uh, tone of, um, of, uh, of this system. So if um, microglia are activated, there's, there's um, changes in the actually um, uh, uh, 
potassium uh, transporter, potassium chloride transporter, and actually makes these uh, dopaminergic, uh, these GABAergic neurons more easily to, to fire. So there's an increased GABAergic tone on these dopaminergic neurons. So as I say, we've done some work on that. And then of course, um, you know, after a long time, we still have these memory cells, which can be um, activated with a life um, stressor. So, uh, and these can trigger again, trigger the, um, uh, trigger the uh, relapse of uh, drug taking. So we, 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 we um, uh, me and Kathy, we wrote this uh, review um, really to sort of describe this um, this idea that this that the the, um, the real driver was this memory of relief of negative affect uh, for, for, for drug taking which um, I think rings true on most of the data that uh, we found in the, in the drug literature so I think that's all I have to say uh, for the introduction and um, I think that's it isn't it yep that's it thank you Chris uh, excellent. Um, Talk um, later. Uh, do so, people want to ask some questions? I love those pictures <laughs> in the beginning that the ah. gentleman drew. Mm -hmm, those are really cool. <laughs> yeah, they are. An idea of what's happening. Yeah, they, 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 they're good for the intoxicated state, but they don't really reflect what's happening afterwards, right? So, you know, people focus on the intoxicated state, they don't focus on on the withdrawal states and the, you know, when they talk about drugs, they usually focus on the intoxicated state. And I think that's a big mistake because, um, you know, the, the, the withdrawal states and the abstinence states are really much more important to focus on. That makes sense. Thank you. There was a recently a young man in Los Angeles who died from taking Xanax that was laced with fentanyl. Yeah. Who, who laces Ooh. things? Why, why would they do that? Do they make more money from it? Or is it just trying to evil people? Or My, my guess is they're trying to get people hooked on the, um, um, and they, they choose the most addictive thing mm -hmm. they can get their hands on. Fentanyl is really easy to make and is incredibly addictive. So, um, you know, they chuck it. I wouldn't be surprised if many drugs have been tainted with nicotine. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it, 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 that's the trouble with uh, illegal drugs is that there's absolutely no QC from the yeah. uh, from yeah, the you, you, you are absolutely right. But for example, like e-cigarette and THC, that's what they have this lung effect. Yeah, the adverse yeah. effect of e-cigarettes, yeah. the nicotine and THC. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> And 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 the, probably the, the the most serious example is spice, where you know s synthetic marijuana, where the kids think they're getting, you know, synthetic THC, where it really is God knows what, mm -hmm. any chemical that they can put their hands on, and um, you know, there's been many many problems with that because you don't know the off-target effects and et cetera, et cetera. So right, it's a really right. situation. I was wondering, I have a question for Nick, this is for Nick. Because when I look at um, what you've um, um, shown us here, and you, and you, over time, you've looked at the, um, the memory reactions and um, things. So that's why I was wondering, have you um, did any work where you looked at um, the overtime um, use of drugs and um, Alzheimer's and dementia, um, because I would think at some time, at some point with the um, memory, um, something, something kind of shortens out or happens um, there where, um, I guess when it's not, like some people decide that they're no longer gonna use drugs. And is it like a time when, like even though there's that lap, because yeah. like when they're not getting the drug and in their brain over time after not using drugs, is there something that happened there, that blank space where it still affects the memory? Well, I, I, I think most memories are very, very 
uh, are always there. Memories are always there at some place. I mean, you know, as soon as you smell something, you can you can go back to a memory which you 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 can't really access any other time, right? You smell something and suddenly your brain goes back to something. And I think memories are usually always there. It's a matter of accessing them. And, you know, over time, I think they become harder to access, like trying to find a photograph in your photograph album. <laughs> I don't know if you have a iPhone like I have with thousands and thousands of phone photos, but trying to find them is really difficult these days. Um, but I, I, I think it's kind of like that, that one, when, when, um, um, you know, people age out a lot from drugs. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people take drugs pretty heavily between 18 and 25, and then they age out. And I think that's that's not atypical at all. And um, whether that's um, because, you know, a change in, in peer versus family influence or responsibilities or whatever, the, 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 the memories I'm sure are still there about what's happened. Um, but I think that, that their salience maybe has changed. So, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think the, the reason why we have such a comorbidity with mental illness and, and, and addictions is because the salience of the drug is much more important. So if you have a drug which takes away your depressive state or your anxiety state, the salience is really important. The, the meaning of that drug is really important. You're not, never going to forget that if you were in an anxiety state and you took an opiate, that it took away that anxiety state. That's going to be there forever if you have problem with anxiety. If you have depression and, and, and the drug takes away that depressive state, that's going to be a real salient aspect to you. But if you have you know, if your life's going well and, and uh, you don't have um, these mental disorders, I think the drugs are much less likely to get hold of, of those, those processes because it's not so salient. It's not so meaningful for, for changing your state. And I think that's why there's this major comorbidity. If you look at the transition, I, I think Larissa Mooney, I don't know if she's here, but uh, Lar Larissa did these e really interesting experiments where she looked at the electronic records of those which transition from pain states to um, uh, opiate use disorder. And it was like 80% had, had a comorbid depression or anxiety disorder. Really, really high. I and, think it's, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because I, I think like in community, I think, I don't know if, if we should call them myths or, because I think when we look at drug use and loved ones and others that we know, that we know that they've done this over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and, and we've seen that the early onset of dementia and Alzheimer's now. And then even for those that have been in abusive relationships in the head. So many times in the community, we are saying that these two things, are associated with what is happening now to the brain, to you know our community. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> is this like? Because I guess trying to figure out is this a myth? Did we just associate this? Um, I don't know how it got associated, but somehow it had that associated. Yeah, I, 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 I mean that there the. <laughs> There is a lot of um, potential for the drugs to initiate some of these uh, neuro neurodegenerative disorders and some of the neuro neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's really um, switch people's brains to addictive states. So, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the literature, with Parkinson, Parkinsonian patients, there's there's a real switch to impulsivity. Um, so maybe there is sort of correlations there which tend to um, go on. I'm not sure so much about Alzheimer's, but um, Parkinson's for sure. There's relationships, but um, you know, I, 
I, I, I think that the memory processes are really, really key, how, uh, how they get laid down and how much of your brain is sort of dedicated to the memory of the drug and what it's done and the salience of it, uh, how important it is for your psyche. Uh, I think that's a real important part of addiction. And that's, I think, what explains the fact that some people don't get addicted and some people do. It's just a matter of the salience of that to your psyche and how important it is in in changing your your things which really bother you within yourself. Uh, okay, Chris, uh, thank you so much. It was a great talk, a really good discussion. We're going to move on to Dr. Nick uh, Nick.